Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me quite clearly. I'd like to invite you, whether it's afternoon or morning to those in New York, to this workshop on sound policy making for sustainable development. It promises to be quite an exciting workshop and already it appears that we have more than 140 participants from across the various uh, sub-regions of the African continent. As you are aware, the Committee of Experts on Public Administration adopted 11 principles of effective governance for sustainable development at its 17th session in 2018. In that very year, they were in, uh, these uh, principles were endorsed by the Economic and Social Council. The principles provide a framework for assessing institutional capacities and are meant to assist interested countries in identifying ways of building effective, accountable and inclusive institutions to achieve the SDGs. I think of particular importance is the fact that at this moment, when we are dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic across the world, these uh, principles are also proving to be quite important as we take our work forward and in view of the importance of public institutions and, and more so looking at policy making. One of the 11 principles is sound policy making and I'd like to quote, to achieve their intended results, public policies are to be coherent with one another and founded on true or well-established grounds in accordance with fact, reason, and good sense, close quotes. The voluntary national reviews of the past five years show that some of the common challenges around the world uh, is to sound policy making. And these challenges include deficiencies in long-term strategic planning, insufficient attention to policy synergies, and lack of integrated mechanisms for monitoring and evaluation. As an African, I would like to argue that these are also the issues that we have grappled with in public administration and in the public service. So as we consider, consider this, we also take into account insufficient synergy, communication and coordination between different bodies and a fragmentation of mandates and responsibilities for implementation. That's actually been the biggest challenges, amongst the biggest challenges for our largest economies and even the LDCs and the more fragile economies. Countries have developed a range of uh, strategies to deal with this, but these phenomena confirm that effective governance and the achievement of the sustainable development goals will require addressing long-standing challenges for public institutions, including the various strategies we are going to discuss this morning. So I'd like to start by giving the floor, if I'm permitted uh, to say so, to a dear sister, um, and uh, the UN Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs of DESA, Ms. Marie Francesca uh, Spat uh, Spatolisano. Um, and she will help set the stage for our work today. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, dear Geraldine, indeed. Distinguished participants, resident coordinators, colleagues, uh, 
On behalf of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this workshop on sound policy making for sustainable development. And I wish to thank, first of all, Ms. Geraldine fraser Molikeri, indeed, my dear sister, Chair of the Committee of Experts on Public Administration, SEPA, and the moderator of this session today for her collaboration with us on this initiative. But I also want to thank her for her ongoing efforts to promote the principles of effective governance for sustainable development in Africa. This workshop follows up on the meeting we held uh, at the end of October 2019 in Pretoria, South Africa, where together with the APRM and other partners, we discussed the application of the principles of effective governance in African countries. At that meeting, we discussed how to equip uh, institutions to implement the two most powerful instruments of change in Africa, the 2030 Agenda and Agenda 2063, and how best to harmonize and create maximum synergies between them. And we concluded that the principles of effective governance can guide us in institutionalizing pathways to sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, Sound policy making as a principle is universally applicable and relevant in all governing paradigms, regardless of variations in national legal systems. Indeed, experience around the world shows us that there is no single institutional model which governments should strive to emulate. Africa is complex and solutions to the challenges of governance on the continent must be responsive to the diverse context of African societies. Governments are and should be at the center of efforts to marshal and mobilize financing, enhance national implementation and strengthen institutions to achieve the sustainable development objectives by the target date and leave no one behind. But building strong institutions for implementation of the SDGs is not a matter for governments alone. Capable, adept and agile institutions involve the whole of government and the whole of society. And this means involve, uh, to involve all levels of government and all relevant stakeholders whether it's parliaments, oversight institutions, civil society, acting in a coherent and cohesive fashion. Now, public institutions play a multifaceted role in advancing sustainable development, including uh, by formulating sound policy, public policies, and ensuring efficiency in delivery of essential public services. Even more so now that the impact of COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the role of public institutions in providing essential public services. The challenges facing the public sector that existed before the pandemic have become more prevalent and prominent. Governments around the world were unprepared for this crisis and inadequacies in public infrastructure and investment have been laid bare. The principle we are discussing today, that of sound policy making, together with the other 10 principles enumerated by SEPA and endorsed by ECOSOC in 2018, can promote effective institutions and make a significant contribution to the achievements of the 2030 Agenda and Agenda 2063. Achieving the SDGs is not uh, a small task. It requires a multidimensional and integrated approach. It requires intra and inter-agency cooperation and collaboration within governments. Strengthening institutional capacities 
to effectively respond to deliver on the SDGs requires risk-informed governance and evidence-based decision-making. It requires bridging silos in policy-making, strategic foresight, regulation of impact, and effective data sharing, among other things. Seen together, they call for public policies to be coherent with one another and founded, as Geraldine was quoting, on true or well-established grounds in full accordance with fact, reason, and good sense. Distinguished participants, international and regional institutions have a significant role to play in supporting governments in their efforts to achieve governance and development outcomes. And interagency coordination is, again, crucial for delivery. So we are very pleased at the involvement of uh, the resident coordinators and members of the United Nations country teams in this initiative. Resident coordinators are at the cornerstone of a coherent and effective United Nations development system, delivering integrated support across the SDGs. Global solidarity and bridging the UN system, bringing sorry, the UN system to work together and to deliver the UN Decade of Action is more crucial now than ever before. DESA stands ready to join these efforts. Dear colleagues, revisiting the role of public institutions, as you are doing today in this workshop, including those at the local level, is imperative. And it must be done with a view to reinvigorating their contributions to achieving the SDGs in the decade of action. Let us join efforts to strengthen evidence-based policy making and analytical capacity as we move forward on action and delivery for sustainable development. I thank you very much. Thank you very much for those words and, and in particular the reminder that we've got to look at evidence-based uh, policy making as we move forward and the critical importance uh, of attaining and achieving um, the SDGs. At this point, uh, um, I'd like to indicate that we'll be focusing on uh, a few countries on the African, uh, in Africa, and I will mention some of them. These include Ghana, Kenya, Mauritius, and Uganda, among others. The African peer review mechanism have worked with all these countries in implementing a baseline study on effective governance. We are aware of a number of, the, of good practices in the region, and we are happy to learn today from lessons on how sound policy making has been crafted in Africa. We hope the discussion this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are, can contribute not only to increased awareness on the, uh, on the issues of sound policy making, but also identify action oriented uh, and concrete activities and capacity building initiatives to enhance, enhance sound policy making that can be um, undertaken with the support of the United Nations system as spelled out by the Assistant Secretary General and other organization. So the workshop is divided in two parts. The first will consider regional perspectives on sound policy making. And the second will be a discussion of four out of eight specific strategies to operationalize this principle. Guidance notes on all of them have been made available on the website, and we encourage you to refer to them as we go along. We will also have a question and answer session um, after both panels. And I've already seen that a number of uh, participants 
have posted greetings on the chat box, uh, um, on the chat box uh, or discussion box um, of this uh, particular workshop. So I'd like you to encourage you to, to actually pose questions or comments to the panelists as we go along. Um, you can contribute to the discussion in that way um, through this chat function that I've called the discussion function. Um, and just a small reminder that participants should have their cameras and their audio settings switched off at all times. Now, at this point, I would hand, like to hand over to the first panel uh, and panelists that will deal with perspectives from the region. And this is uh, another uh, sister of mine, Professor Margaret Cobia. She's the cabinet secretary of the Ministry of Public Service youth and gender affairs in Kenya. She will always, and she's been the one that reminded us at our last meeting of SEPA that COVID-19 was actually putting, uh, was, was uh, putting not only us to the test, but the principles to the test. So over to you, Professor, because I'm aware that you've submitted the case on Kenya that's being considered and integrated into the African Peer Review Mechanism Benchmark Report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, uh, for the opportunity. Panelists, distinguished participants, I'm very happy to share the Kenyan experience on how the principles uh, of support and effective governance and also uh, in sustainable development. I'm going to ask Andriana to share my slides. I, I, I think uh, if that can happen, it will be good. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to slide number two uh, so that we have an idea uh, what we are in uh, this, this time. Uh, I'm just going to talk about very quickly what are the 11 principles and then uh, the South, uh, South policy making and why it matters, Foundation for South Making. Institution Framework for Kenya and the Lessons Land. Next. Uh, regarding uh, I, uh, from SEPA, and I like staying with the SEPA principles because somebody else can argue uh, whose principles are these, but these are SEPAs, and they are put in three categories, that is effectiveness, accountability, and inclusiveness. And each one of them has a certain number. There are three in effectiveness, accountability, and inclusiveness. So you total they make 11. Today we are going to be focusing on sound policy making, which is under the category of effectiveness in the public service or effectiveness in governance. Next. Uh, you may have heard from my sister Jordan that uh, public policies are detailed government statements on how the problem that the citizens face uh, identified and then designing the right responses. Uh, sound policies matter as they provide the intended government results. Every government exists to deliver goods and services to the citizen. The rule may be the way we do infrastructure, education, social protection programs, all those unless we have a policy that we are trying to say, what are we trying to achieve next? And uh, why the sound policy making matters, we are saying basic public policy, you have to uh, be sound using evidence from data, non-guesswork. You also have to be standardized regulation because you know policies also are the source of laws. It has to be predictable and also it has to measure, the policy has to be measured. It has also to demonstrate effective use of uh, economic resources that are remitted. It is also policies also guide public sector reforms. I think we have talked about public sector reform for long because every environment, every uh, year we find what worked yesterday might not work today. Therefore, environment changes and that calls for public sector reform, which may call for policy review. 
uh, development, sustainability, we have to, to have sustainable development and the policy support that. People participation in the Kenyan experience is very, very central. If you are going to make a policy that is supposed to address a certain challenge, like maybe youth development policy, then you have to involve all the stakeholders. And then there are foundations for policy coherency. And I'm very happy today we are addressing ourselves to policy coherence because we know in the past, every department in government want to do their policy without seeing to what extent do they cut across so that we are, when we are addressing a problem in youth policy development, is also addressing issues in education. In Kenya, let me come to Kenya now. We have what we call Kenya Vision 2030. It aims uh, Kenya to become newly industrialized, middle income country providing a high quality of life for all. We are in the, now in the lower middle income. Using this policy, we know where Kenya is going. And this policy helps uh, the Kenyans or Kenyan government to know where do you want to be. It is also very much aligned with Constitution 2030, Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, and the Sustainable Development Goals. To me, this, as we work in the government, we are always asking ourselves, even if we have SDGs and we have all those other agendas elsewhere, the results are to be realized on the ground in the in Kenyan experience. So alignment of that goes, therefore, when we are doing voluntary national reviews, it will also be used the same framework that we report at the national level can also be used to report at a, a global level. Then we use strategic planning because you see with this uh, vision 2030, we have to divide every year, five year plan so that you will be able to know to what extent the policies we are developing are supporting in the five year uh, plan. So we do the policy formulation implementation process where we consider coherence Data and evidence is very important. Sector arrangement, public participation, where you bring everybody who is going to be affected by the policy, then monitoring and evaluation. Then in our Kenyan context, we have these independent commissions, which constantly check to what extent the, the, the policy and the laws are within the constitution. The institutional framework that we use, we have the cabinet at the center, then when we develop, uh, the, 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 we bring other institutions like the civil society, private sector, development partners, citizens, uh, the think tanks, and other research institutions, and the other two arms of government. So that when we develop and formulate these policies that have to support um, government delivery uh, results, then we are all together. Next. When you look at the institutions and where do we get these policies originating from, we have the center of government, which is the cabinet, where we generate cabinet memorandum to articulate what did we want to achieve, white papers, vision, and development agenda. Parliament is another source as an institution uh, for budget laws and regulation. Judiciary also brings in the component because as the laws are made from the policy, then the judiciary also arbitrates on those laws made. Ministries and departments are responsible for the budget, the regulations and guidelines. Service commission, I, I mentioned, they are the checks and balance for oversight provision. Then we have what we call state owned or state corporations, which have regulations and guidelines. All these policy uh, mark a certain standard in a coherent manner. We also have two levels of government in Kenya, county government and national level. That is where now we talk about subsidiarity uh, relation in, in terms of how much uh, is going to be realized right at the ground, at the ground grassroots level, and with what budget and how the regulations of national government and the county government work together for delivery of services. Well, in Kenyan the context is like anywhere else, we start with the designing the and the formulation of the policy. Then we go to implementation, monitoring and evaluation, and then we review. And if there are any policy gaps, we put, that is used for again to input in the formulation. Next. Then uh, are there lessons learned in, the, in that journey right from formulating, implementing? monitoring or having data and they hear 
uh, government statistical offices are very important, the think tank to give us information to what extent has the policies worked to support government deliver on its promises. Are there lessons learned? Yes. We have seen with the policy, if I look five years ago, how we used to develop policies, the citizens are more engaged in policy participation. And in fact, a policy or a law can be outlawed if the judiciary says that uh, there was no adequate public participation. We even have a law on public participation. What would it entail? We also have lessons from judicial intervention as the courts are also ruling against laws or policies that do not include people. Decline in our elite capture. This used to be a very elite oriented in public policy, but now we are seeing with developmental states, more people involved, including uh, those in the middle and the lower. Enhanced private sector aggressiveness before, uh, we define that private sector kind of tended to leave government to do the policies. Today, that is not the case. They influence public policy, and especially when it comes to PPPs, that we find public uh, private sector getting at the central. We have a devolution and the call for enhanced policy coherence. This is something we have come to find it very, very central, both the vertical and um, horizontal uh, coherence, so that we are not generating policies that are counterproductive. We are aware of sometimes we will generate a policy in health, which is counterproductive with the Department of, uh, of Environment or Climate Change. Silent mentality is a lesson that we, they, there is a tendency to want to work around my department without really bringing the interagency so that we have a better policy. Then in multilateral collaboration that supports cycle capacity, we have found giving us more better policies during as a formulation or review. Then are there constraints? Of course, there's limited policy coherence or sometimes conflicting counterproductive policies across the sector. And we have realized there's also complexity of policy making. It's not something we, it is something that grow with the growth in the public service. That means the senior officials develop the competencies to be able to make the policies that are responsive to the citizen needs. This is also a technical and the capacity. Uh, we need technical skills and the capacity for policy reviews. Political interference is very common. Lack of evidence sometimes, uh, lack of data or the data quality, limited technology integration. And I have in mind now with the COVID-19, the all of human resource policies are changing and we are finding to what extent that uh, advances in technology are affecting our policies. Uh, I think the next one, budgetary limitation, I think that is common that uh, every department is trying to go to national treasury to get some budgetary support. But you find you can have a policy, very good policy on the shelf, but one of the things government have been blamed in Kenya is having a very good policy, but it's not being implemented. Why? Due to um, budgetary constraints. Next. Recommendations, are, are, as uh, I wind up with this, we, my recommendation are we need systematic sector-wide capacity building in public policy cycle. We also need to be more concerned with supply side. That is, we have the right data, focus on the system. Government is a system. And unless all systems agree to move together, you'll find we might not move at the speed that we require. For example, if we have a policy in the basic education, and perhaps the, the National Treasury did not provide the resources, or Ministry of Education did not prepare adequate uh, teachers with adequate capacity. So that system thinking becomes very critical. We have to support if the policy matters, so give it support with the budget. Technology integration is also key. Improvement in policy coherence and being more in inclusive that nobody is left behind. Uh, and in this case, you might wonder to what extent do we know people have adequate information to make contribution during participation so that we can say their views have been included. 
We need a better public sector interface with the think tanks. I think uh, public policy think tank in Africa, in Kenya, become very, very central to work with the government so that they can be able to evaluate policy or bring in data or bring in theories that they make us understand better how, how we are going to work around policy, especially if the policy context changes. Strengthening oversight institution, in my view, it is very important. For example, statistic offices, okay, the Kenya Bureau of Statistics, and also national audit office. So one area that we may realize and appreciate here is the need of all these offices working together to deliver on policy that will make a government deliver on its, um, on its promise and above all, deliver the sustainable development goals. Institutionalization of public policy coordination and innovation in the whole government approach, we have a hand of other countries like UK, where they have even have a policy lab, improving policy and focus among other actors, like public, public, public places, how can we kind of improve that advocacy? By the time maybe even uh, the policy is implemented in government, the public, uh, the private sector also appreciates and they see to what extent we are we improving the environment within which their business can thrive and build the national economy. Because with, without the growth to economic growth, even the job that we want for the youth becomes quite evasive. Enhance political level interference. I think that because polit politic level is about particular interest in a particular time. Therefore, you may be making a very good policy in Kenya, but we have to find a way of how do we know the policy we are making has not been hijacked by politician, but is going to serve the Ranja society. With those many remarks, Chair, I want to stop here so that I can give an opportunity to our next person. That is the Kenyan experience. I thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not going to do any further lengthy introductions. Safe to call Mr. Charles Paul Abani, the United Nations Resident Coordinator um, in Ghana to address us next. I've noted the questions that are in the chat and we'll deal with it during question time. Over to you, resident coordinator. So um, good afternoon to, to you distinguished panelists, um, distinguished participants, um, ladies and gentlemen, fellow colleagues from within the UN system. I, I, I come to this conversation less as a policy expert, but more from a sort of practitioner's perspective, trying to input um, at least lessons learned and experiences um, in, into this policy process. Um, and often working with colleagues who um, come up with brilliant policy on paper that then doesn't translate into action or produces results that were unintended and, and don't meet the policy goals. And so uh, I, I think that this uh, workshop is extremely important. There are a lot of tools here to be used and I'm sure we'll talk about them extensively, but I think that that premise upon which policy um, is designed and implemented is extremely important in how policymakers reflect on this. So the first point for me is that while policymaking is a technical process that requires good technical skills, it's essentially a political process. Uh, of translating, um, I guess, aspirations into um, practical ways in which uh, those things have legs and hit the ground. And therefore, by, by implication, it, it's fundamentally chaotic and messy. And, and increasingly, uh, where we live within a very complex interconnected world, uh, complexity is another component that we must take account of. Um, and, I, and, and therefore, there aren't, you know, even while we define the, the principles that, that uh, earlier speakers have talked about, about founded on truth, um, data evidence, those things mean different things um, to different people. I think the other important thing too is that context matters. Um, and that um, the differences in context mean that while the general principles apply, it's important always to contextualize them. We've always talked about no one size fits all, but I think really um, understanding those um, is, is really important. 
And so for me, advocating and understanding political economy approaches and analysis is actually central to good design. Um, there are a number of key points, and I'll just use a bit of the framework that's out there for accountability ecosystems. Who are the stakeholders and what, what, what are their, their interests? And, and a key word that must come into this is incentives. And incentives doesn't mean cash handouts. It means why would I do this? Uh, because it is a political process. So that stakeholder mapping is really important. The integration that the, the last speaker talked about, really powerful. Um, we talk about, the, the, that, that system talks about horizontal and vertical integration, which means that not only must we think about things in terms of ministries uh, across line, but can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. But also, um, you must think about the horizontally. And horizontally, I mean from local to global, because there are global policies that impact national policies, and of course, national policies that impact um, local policies. And so failure to see that integration um, is, is one of the key er reasons why, in a silo, a policy appears to be great, and the moment it's interjected, it runs into all sorts of um, issues. I think that, that often, too, um, a coherent vision is central. And I'll talk a bit about Ghana in this context. So at a global level, we're all committed to the SDGs, um, you know, Agenda 2030, Agenda 2063, which has been articulated. But how does that manifest itself at a national level um, in clear, coherent form that enables them policy to follow into that process? For Ghana, that vision of Ghana beyond aid um, is a really critical one, which really talks about a self-reliant, uh, prosperous nation that is taking its own place among the committee of nations. And so what does that mean in terms of the different sectors and how it will achieve that? Um, the articulation of its bold vision for re, uh, reinvestments that are needed to fight back after COVID, uh, articulated through its CARES document, really, really important. Its aspirations as a regional integrator and player, the chair of ECOWAS, um, a, lo a lot of roles within the Africa Union, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, all in, in, in Accra. What does this mean for the kinds of policy that, that happen nationally, but as importantly, how Ghana and its policymakers are engaging internationally? We've talked about uh, COVID, and I think you know, COVID is a really important contextual issue. It's shown us inequalities, inequalities between countries, inequalities within countries. Um, it's, it spurred us on to the 2030 agenda about new greener growth that means that the planet will, will survive. But what does this mean for Ghana and its economy? A lot of the funding that it has comes from fossil fuel generation. So how is it going to make policy, not just nationally that impacts its citizens, but in the global context, in which greener trajectories are likely to be the future, but its source of resources are really on, on fossil fuels. The whole question of digital transformation. Yes, we can see the impacts of digital transformation in our lives every day, this conference, the fact that we're all on Zoom, but, but who owns this intellectual property of, of, of digitalization? And how are, we, how are we really catapulting and taking advantage of these opportunities to transform the way our economy works through greater efficiencies, the way our children learn in a continent that has a huge learning deficit, and also on transparency and accountability issues, which are, are critical to making sure that policy is actually implemented and policymakers are, are, are held accountable. So there are, there are lots of things here that are really important. And I would strongly advocate that uh, part of this series is really uh, assisting policymakers to really understand that political economy analysis, to do the, the kind of um, understanding that enables them to see not just where policy sits within an ecosystem, within a country, but within the global context, so that the complexity is clear. We talk about wicked problems in the world, and we know that many of them... Can, can I... Yeah, can I, on those wicked problems, ask you to just wind up, sort of, uh, and, and we'll take the rest of the thoughts in the discussion. 
Well, I mean, okay. Well, thank you. Um, let me stop there then. I, I do. I do think though that unless you address, unless you identify transformational policy options, and particularly around wicked problems, that we're unlikely to see the transformation we need to see on the continent. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thanks for ending on that high note on the importance of transformational policies. Um, I will then proceed immediately to Mr. Bartholomew Ahmad, um, the Director of Macroeconomic Governance uh, uh, of the Macroeconomic Governance Division. As you are aware, we're sort of running out of time for the first part of this meeting. So if you will indulge me and proceed, but do so within seven minutes, thanks. Okay, sure, I, I'll, I'll try to do that. Um, I, I think um, the previous speaker really has outlined a lot of the key issues. Uh, uh, it, there is no shortage of policies um, in developing countries. And I think the, the challenge has been the effectiveness of such, such policies uh, has been undermined by the way we implement those policies or our capacities to implement those policies. And these capacities are both technical and, and, and political. And I think the political economy dimension is, needs to be stressed. Um, now, the, I think it's, of course, it is key that to implement policies, we need to strengthen the capacities of our institutions, uh, public uh, in particular to, to execute those policies and that we also need uh, to get stakeholder buy-in. And it's really in the area of stakeholder buy-in that we need to really be aware upfront that uh, there are uh, vested interests and certain policies have implications for the uh, vested interests and, and, and well-being of certain groups. So we need to be able to, to negotiate and provide uh, uh, a reason for, for uh, different stakeholders to really buy into those policies. Um, but I'd like to speak uh, to some of the issues of the how in terms of uh, particularly the issue of coherence, right? Uh, we talked about um, vertical and uh, horizontal coherence. Often uh, countries, um, uh, for example, are asked to uh, integrate the national uh, agenda 2063 commitments like agenda 2063 and agenda 2030 into the national policy frameworks. But uh, the question, the thing is that uh, there are several of these frameworks, uh, including, for example, the Vienna Program of Action. So a key to horizontal coherence is really understanding how those policy commitments uh, are related. And uh, ECA has developed a tool that helps countries to see the interlinkages between the, inter the international commitments, which is then a prerequisite for integration into their national plans. Now, um, on these tools, it's also important. Um, they are also important because they also help you to understand um, how ex ante or before the fact of how these policies are supposed to impact uh, and individuals on the ground. So a critical part of the policy making is really tools that give you an idea of what the likely policy impacts will be. For example, uh, with respect to the um, COVID pandemic, uh, different countries have adopted different stimulus packages and, and, and embedded in these packages are different approaches. For example, the EU and Japan the fiscal policy responses have provided liquidity uh, uh, for two different groups. In the US, it's really in the form of direct income support to households. In, in, in contrast, in China, it has been through uh, uh, providing new investments to support job growth and recovery. Now, how these types of emergency uh, programs will shape recovery and growth remains an open question but the likely outcomes can be simulated through models that estimate short-term, long-term effects. In, in developing countries, this is important because if these measures do not stimulate investment and growth, public debt will likely become unsustainable. So really we need also to strengthen capacities in terms of modeling policy impacts. Um, the, the issue of financing has been discussed um, and integration in national development plans has been also been discussed. 
uh, but it's, it's really important to really link these policy, uh, certain po policies, particularly those that have financial implications to our national budgets and medium term expenditure frameworks. But also it's important to communicate uh, what these policies are uh, to us, so as to get uh, buy-in and also to um, uh, ensure that um, stakeholders are involved also in the, in the tracking of the implementation of these policies. But I would like to say that really a critical part of these issues is what happens when policies are not uh, adhered to? Do we have a critical mechanism of enforcement? And here an example is in the case, is, uh, a good example is the tax system, uh, the IRS in the US. I mean, um, individuals who do not pay their taxes really have face a credible threat of, 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 of enforcement. But do we have those kinds of systems in our countries? Because without the lack of credi credible enforcement, uh, the policies basically become uh, pieces of paper that are lifeless. A key to cred credible enforcement, uh, use of technologies, um, and also attitudes and commitment to commitment and incentive to enforce. Uh, for example, in, in Ghana, one of the ways that have been employed to ensure that uh, uh, tax administration entities collect it, uh, effectively meet their targets is to give them um, a portion of the revenues that they generate to build their capacity. So really coming back to the issue of really incentivizing enforcement, either technically through technology, but also through motivational factors, such as, uh, as I discussed in terms of giving some of the entities, some of these uh, revenues. Um, and if you look at, for example, the AFCFTA, which is a wonderful idea. Now, the question is, we have a lot of situations where uh, informal barriers to trade exist. Uh, so on paper, yes, we want to, We've removed, we've removed our, our tariff barriers, but the informal tariff barriers exist. Uh, how do you ensure that those ba barriers are removed? Technology is one way to do it, but we also need to think about other ways. Uh, and then finally, the issue of illicit financial flows. We have a lot of policies in place to address illicit financial flows, but without the uh, technical capacities, institutional support to help countries do this, and also uh, the credible threat of, 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 of really uh, ensuring that these institutions that fail to uh, follow up on these commitments are, are sanctioned, uh, illicit financial flows will continue. So I am mindful of the time uh, situation here, but uh, really the main point here is that it's, it is both a technical exercise and a political exercise, and it requires incentives. And I'm really, uh, I think that these are areas we need to work on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bartholomew. Um, I'm immediately going to move on to Ger Bukhart, who is also a member of the Committee of Experts of Public Administration and a Bureau member. And as he is due to speak, I'd like to ask panelists to just follow the questions and comments in the chat box and you can already start responding to that, uh, to them um, on the chat box. So over to you, Gert. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I hope I'm loud and clear. I will be very yes, short. The, the crucial problem with sound policy making is actually that we all agree about it. Nobody's against it. Uh, and the question is, if nobody's against it, why doesn't it happen or as we wish there? I will uh, raise four points here, uh, why it is and how we could tackle it. The third is ownership. We need to create ownership. The second is how can we translate this concept into new practices? The third thing is how can we disseminate it? And the fourth is because it's a long marathon, how can we be, remain motivated? So the first one is ownership. I think the very concrete answer on how to enhance ownership uh, in a practical way is to mobilize our schools, our national schools, where we train 
our civil servants. And I think it's more than knowledge, it's about a culture. And it's about a culture to really reflect critically about what works and what doesn't work and why. And of course, not to copy paste from the past or from other countries. I think universities, uh, and, you know, it was reference to context does matter. The local universities and research centers should make a difference and have an input there. That's the first point, ownership. The second point is how do we translate this concept into concrete new action? And I think here it means we have to have starting positions. Uh, there was reference that we have enough policies already, national strategies, specific policy strategies and organizational strategies and then sound policies. We actually have to connect these sound policies with budgets and we have to make sure that the budgets also include performance indicators, which in this case are the SDG outcomes. And it could help to have pilots, well-defined pilots, to translate these sound policy making into concrete uh, and new practices. That's the second point. The third point is, how do we spread this? How do we share this? I think it's very important to create platforms for bench learning. And again, the schools could play a role there, not just for new civil servants, but to recurrent training, to imply a bench learning platform where the practices are shared, not just the solutions, but also the problems and how to tackle them and to see and to talk critically what works, what doesn't work and why. That is the third point. The fourth point is we have to run a marathon. How do we stay motivated? How do we do that? I think it's, we have to be aware that uh, long-term result, results are not just a sequence of quick wins, even if quick wins are important. So we create, we should create a culture of feedback and bench learning again. It implies coaching, help desks, peer learning, not just for the leadership peer learning, but also for the grassroots. And we have to show results. Um, sound policy making should lead to sound policies and sound policies should lead to better service delivery. Um, and this should be done, but it should also be seen to be done. And so from that point of view, communication, it was mentioned before, we have to show results. So four things, ownership translated to concrete actions and disseminate and keep motivation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Gert, and thanks for staying um, within the time. So I'm going to pose the first question to um, the resident coordinator in Ghana. And this is uh, the, the one question that has arisen is, so how do African countries practically introduce and implement transformational policies when almost all governments change these frameworks every four years <clears throat> after elections without ever following what are supposed to be the national framework slash aspirations. So uh, if you permit me, um, Charles, if I can ask you to respond to that one. So, so thank you. And, and I think it's, um, it's a really, I think a lot of the speeches are interconnected uh, very, very well, the presentations. I think that, you know, we talked about the need to uh, articulate policy and vision very clearly. And often political transition um, is a time when, when things derail. And I think it behoves these points that, you know, the last speaker particularly spoke about, about ensuring that, that the process is inclusive. Um, and it isn't just a narrow set of political interests, but broad based. And some of the tools are there to design um, kind of like visions that go well beyond uh, an immediate government. So of course, yes, a, a, a smooth transition assists that, but I think greater, of greater importance is a buy-in that isn't set in the context of a winner-takes-all 
uh, political approach. And so fixing some of that political approach that means that winners take all and losers lose everything is part of the strategy for ensuring that, that there is coherence that transcends political um, divides. And I think that the kind of capacity that sits within uh, particularly the public service and the consistency of that capacity is another important um, element because although it's true that politicians come and go, those staff um, are critical and stay in role. And so how they're able to say, these are the policies we're trying to achieve, the framework around achieving the 2030 agenda, the 2063 agenda are embedded in policy and where possible legislation that actually transcends um, these four year terms. These are some of my thoughts um, about this. And again, referring to wicked problems, very often those wicked problems pitch oppositions against one party against the other. And so finding the, the middle ground uh, in the policy design process is absolutely critical. Thank you. There's a similar question that's come from Joseph Dada, and he's pre uh, posed this to all panelists, but I, like to start with you, Margaret, and it's linked to the previous one. He says, with respect to Africa, how do we tackle the unique challenge of poor policy making arouse, uh, arising from the round peg in a square hole mentality, which allows those with little or no knowledge whatsoever of policy making to occupy strategic offices? How do we tackle or rather or or resolve the consistent rift between the executive and the legislators in the policy making sphere, especially as it relates to power sharing and responsibilities? So there's actually two parts to it and one a little bit prickly, but over to you, Margaret. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, let me say that uh, we, we need to to realize that our uh, national visions, which are very inclusive to include everyone, like in the Kenyan experience, when we developed our national vision in the year 2008, we kind of brought everybody on the table because we knew we had never asked ourselves, what do we want for Kenya? With the national vision, which is almost that years, then, uh, Every government that comes uh, after the election, it can be judged by the extent to which they are implementing the flagship project of the national of the vision. Therefore, for, for me, with the Kenyan experience, the, the civil service and the political uh, class uh, have to find a, a mineral ground where they agree as you, are, you come into government. This is our national vision, and these are the deliverables. For example, I think we also need in Africa to agree what are some of the key uh, kind of um, uh, sectors that must be put in our, in our vision. For example, if you are thinking education, health, agriculture, and the infrastructure, that we have asked ourselves where we want our health to be, especially when you are talking about universal health coverage where we want our education to take our youth. So there are some areas in national vision that if we have asked ourselves where we want to go, then the, our policy will be more deliberate and more targeted. I also, my second point on the political will and the, the interface between the politician, or maybe the minister and the technocrats. Being able to say in, in this government, this is what you want to deliver, because the politician must be able to see what is innate in these policies that we are de developing that will help them come in the next government. But also the technocrats, in my view, should also be able to see what is it that uh, we can create synergy between the politician and the technocrat to deliver for the good of the country as far as the vision is concerned. So I think to me that is very important. My third point would be accountability. Who is policing the government? So that as we cannot do without civil society, so that they can be able to point out some of the areas agreed in the national long-term vision. 
that maybe the government has not been able to de deliver. So holding accountability is very key to ensure that the policies and divisions also work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will then go to Bartholomew and we'll conclude with Gert. And, and the big question here is how can DESA support for better sustainable development policy design and implementation to African governments? How can this be improved? Um, this comes from, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Fanny Kluter, Prof. Fanny Kluter. And he goes on to say, I'm thinking of making available technical policy design and implementation assistance by specialists, specialists in different fields and not only providing advice and finances. The rollout of the fourth industrial revolution governance in Africa faces huge practical readiness problems that seriously inhibit digitalization of public services. Can DESA or other UN agencies also assist here by way of technical assistance facilitation instead of only advice and finances? So um, Bartholomew, you'll start with this and I'm sure it will also be picked up by the next panel. So over to you, Bartholomew. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's definitely a role for DESA to play. Um, the, I think the question is, how can this be done in a way that is sustainable and sustained over time? Um, I think one, DESA needs to work with the, uh, the regional commissions and the uh, uh, resident coordinators in understanding um, what is in the landscape. For example, ECA has been trying to assist countries with the policy modeling, uh, but we find that some of these countries already have their models. So really the first step is really understand where, um, understand that you're not operating from ground zero, what is available at the country level and how can you, um, is there a demand for what you're offering? Because that will then determine whether you help them perfect what they have or you complement what they have, or you bring in, uh, a, you fill a gap. So really that initial assessment of the, the lay of the land is critical. Um, and then secondly, um, there are several cases where we've, that, that, that would help address the second question that is the optic of the tool. So the technical assistance, because sometimes um, the technical assistance is provided, it becomes a one-time uh, event and then uh, countries move on. So really, the second thing is really to figure out a way to institutionalize your assistance by not only um, uh, focusing on public institutions, but bringing in other uh, entities, for example, universities, because we've had a situation where we build capacities or provide technical assistance to countries, but there's a lot of turnover. So you always have to uh, start from scratch. So really it's about institutionalizing the process by bringing in other entities in, in, in that effort and continually evaluating what the, the demands are and, and adapting and changing your processes or approaches to, to reflect the changing and evolving landscape. I think those are my um, views for now, but thank you. Yeah, I'd also just want to recommend that you uh, check the chat as there's a specific follow-up question to you as well. So Gert Bukar, um, Christopher uh, Chinapu had said that sound policy is the result of ongoing interaction. We need to recognize it is not an academic exercise. To build ownership, we need to design Inclusion, create an enabling environment for ongoing engagement, address the needs of the stakeholders and not necessarily the view, view of the technocrats. And I want to add a second one to that by P. Reddy. What are the generic challenges that are impacting 
on policy implementation in Africa and what are the solution? Well, it's actually quite a broad question. So you decide which part you will take. Thanks, Ger. Thank you, Chair. I think I have never believed in copy pasting solutions and uh, that's uh, respecting the, the cultures and the traditions and the legal frameworks and also the political uh, institutions there. Uh, however, I've always believed that uh, learning platforms, sharing good practices, not necessarily best practices because that's very exhausting, but good enough practices to share them, to show that things are possible and feasible and doable. And I think that's an important part to do that and to do that in a mixed community of bench learning, not just technocrats, but including also local governments, uh, NGOs, and a kind of, and there is universities, of course. I think that's a very important uh, issue to have not just a knowledge of good practices, but also a culture of optimism that things are possible. And the second thing is, uh, we have to make sure that our sound policy documents are not disconnected from the budgets. And we have to connect them and to see that these budgets are not just input budgets, but also check for outcomes. Over to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will then directly proceed into the second part. And this will be a discussion of four out of eight specific strategies to operationalize uh, the principles. Um, so I'd immediately want to proceed and call on Patrick Spearing, the secretary of the Committee of Experts on Public Administration. So over to you, Patrick. Thank you very much, Chair. I guess this is more the technical side of the workshop. Uh, as you have seen, this principle of sound policy making has been associated with eight strategies. The, the Chair has just mentioned that. Uh, and these uh, strategies are meant to assist with the operationalization, getting to the question of implementation. And uh, DESA has engaged a number of experts to assist uh, with this uh, advice, with advice on implementation of these strategies. Um, and we're going to hear from uh, some of these uh, experts today. These are leading, leading uh, experts in their field who have also had the opportunity to tap into their global network. So the notes that they, pre they prepared and which you see online uh, on the event website uh, are uh, in a sense, uh, represent the collective knowledge of the, of the top, uh, top uh, individuals uh, in these uh, fields of, uh, of uh, practice. So I want to um, say um, that we hope that the notes will provide some clarity. Uh, we know that, uh, that there are many players at the country level, regional level, global level, and a proliferation of tools. We know that country teams uh, are um, a little bit overwhelmed by all of these uh, methods and, and, and um, tools that are available. And so one, one objective of these notes uh, is to try to bring some clarity and to help those who may know a little bit less about these strategies or a little more about these strategies to see uh, what they are and, and how they can be um, enhanced uh, where they're needed in different countries. Uh, the notes, well, I don't want to explain too much about them. We'll hear um, about the content, uh, but you, you can see that they cover uh, questions of about understanding the strategy, methods of implementation, how to engage with peer-to-peer -peer, uh, and uh, learning and research networks, where to look for uh, international development assistance in these uh, uh, fields, and so on. So altogether, uh, we hope that this provides a very rich uh, uh, set of um, guideline, guidance, uh, guidelines um, for, for operationalization. And um, as we go through this, of course, uh, there is, there is a uh, need to connect uh, the regional perspectives that we've just heard and national perspectives uh, with implementation. So as we hear from these, these distinguished uh, experts, perhaps the participants can think about um, how, to, how to take this work uh, forward and how to really make it um, operational in their context. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Patrick, for that overview. I'll immediately go over on to 
Dr. Muntz Nielsen, the Executive Director of the Stockholm Environment Institute on Promotion of Career and Policy Making. So over to you. And uh, seven minutes if we'd like to engage with the participants. Thank you very much. Um, I'll put on my video. I was planning to show a couple of slides, but the host has disabled screen sharing. So if that can be fixed, it would be good. Um, then I can share uh, my presentation. Let's can see. you start whilst it's being enabled? Yeah, multitasking. So can you see my slide now? Yes. Yes. Okay, very good. So thank you very much. Um, I was um, given the opportunity to try to write down a couple of thoughts around coherent policy making and policy coherence. And I'll give a very brief summary of, of the key issues uh, that I outline in that strategy note. So the, the starting point being, of course, uh, for coherence is that policies hang together and the SDGs, uh, they are together a picture of sustainable development for the world uh, that are universal and equally relevant for uh, all countries. They, however, affect each other. So if you take one uh, goal at a time and give it priority uh, without consideration of the others, you will be able to slow or undo progress in other goals. If you, however, take careful consideration and, and look at how you can uh, get multiple effects, you can use those positive feedbacks and exploit them for better development outcomes. And this is kind of the rationale behind coherence. The problem today, of course, that public administrations are not organized to deal with issues uh, that cross sectors and scales and actor constellations. So we have these silos of policy making, which means that policy issues are fragmented, compartmentalized and quite often there is competition and political economy issues between different sectors of development and between different ministries for example so we need to inject some approaches some methods some simple tools that can be used to uh, enhance policy coherence which is really boils down to the idea of being able to capture uh, synergies and mitigate trade-offs so we can get more robust and more effective policies and implementation strategies. And um, just a context that coherence can be viewed in different dimensions. Uh, there is the horizontal dimension, which is coherence between different policy areas, but there's also the vertical, which is coherence between different levels from global to national to local. There is an international coherence dimension, which is about how our policies affect other countries and development in other countries, transboundary considerations. And there is institutional coherence, that is coherence in how different goals, instruments, implementation practices are uh, working with or against each other. So, there's, well, if you dive into this field, you'll run into a number of different concepts. And I'm just listing a few that are similar, uh, often quite, uh, quite often the same, are used interchangeably. And um, uh, depending a bit on what community of practice uh, you are engaging with. PCD, PCSD has been promoted by the OECD quite a lot. Uh, and they shifted to PCSD in the, uh, uh, with the uh, 2030 agenda being adopted in 2015. Um, one way of looking at coherence is that it's not a defined state. It is really a continuum or it's a sort of a constant aspiration of having 
better interaction, better unification in terms of government policy making. And uh, this scale is a quite useful representation of that, which was uh, called the coordination scale and was uh, published in 1994, where you move from entirely independent, uh, no communication at the first level through communi better communication, consultation, searching for agreement, arbitration, joint up priorities up to an entirely unified strategy. So it's a kind of a normative uh, uh, scale of, of uh, more and more coherence. Now, whether that is good or bad, it's a different issue. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I, I'm not gonna read through this. It's something you can study in the strategy note, but it's useful to see where your own administration finds itself in terms of different dimensions. So how are policies being framed narrowly or broadly? Uh, what is the recognition of policy goals across different sectors? Um, are instruments uh, cutting across sectors or embedded within different systems and the procedural instruments uh, that, uh, that exist, whether there are procedures for increasing cooperation and integration in the system. Um, so where could you start uh, to hammer away at becoming a more coherent, more joined up governance. These are things that have been proposed by in the work on SDG 1714 on policy coherence. It's been proposed in the OECD processes, etc. Quite often they have proven to be effective ways of promoting coherence. Finding a high ranking place in the government for an interagency coordination committee so that the, for example, the 2030 agenda has a central and high ranking place in the bureaucracy. Establishing an institutional mechanism across the ministries for coordination, conducting mapping or simulation exercises type of integrated policy analysis, arranging multi-stakeholder consultation forums, make sure that the SDGs are mainstreamed and visible in policy, development strategies and planning, and also in the budgeting itself. And requesting that impact assessments in relation to the different SDG dimensions are made on draft policy bills. And then you can also impose sectoral mandates. Uh, so different government agencies are is required to monitor and report on how they affect other sectors, uh, other development dimensions than the ones that they have in focus. And finally, engaging actively in those international cooperation and peer learning platforms that exist. And the note describes a couple of those. Uh, and obviously there are uh, at the regional uh, economic commission level, but also in the central United Nations level. Uh, a couple Are of you words. Close to yes, to this is a my close. last, Thank you. my last slide here. Uh, barriers and risks relating to this. Uh, of course, policy coherence is, as always, something that li links to uh, possible negative side effects. It might conflict with routines and procedures that are established. There might be inherent goal conflicts and interest conflicts. There might be lack of resources, lack of political will. There might be experience in the past of coherence that have led to sort of cynicism amongst those that are participating. Uh, it can also be time consuming. It can be blurring lines of accountability and it might make policy effectiveness more difficult to measure. So all of these things, I want to mention them because they come up immediately when you start to try to impose them. But if you try to work intelligently and within an adaptive contextualized approach, what works for your context, then you will be able to counteract these, uh, these risks uh, as you move forward. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I'll be happy to uh, discuss later on.
Thank you very much. Thanks for that overview. And can I now go to Ms. Catterley? And again, if I can just ask that we keep it tight to allow for engagement. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chair. And in fact, um, I am going to be calling upon so much of what people have already talked about around inclusivity, complexity, coherence. But essentially, I think at the heart of what my contribution is, and building on the guidance note, is around strategic foresight. It's around this challenge that Mr. Abani said, which is what does transformative innovation looks like at a given how far short we're falling from the 2030 goals and how the trans uh, the trajectory needs to be transformative. What does that mean we do differently? And how do we do planning in a world in which uh, we can't actually take it for granted? It doesn't look tomorrow like it did today. We're surrounded by disruptions and transformations and elephants that are in the room that we need to engage with like climate change and inequality. And so because of that, uh, we need to still engage with that uncertainty and still do strategic planning. And therefore, the approach that I've been talking about called strategic foresight um, is very much based on this very practical experience from working with people around the world and action research and case study insights on how do you actually still make effective plans out to 2030 when technology is surrounding uh, your next generation have got very different values. Demography means that things are really changing very rapidly around you. And essentially, there's three uh, core principles about engaging with the drivers of change, those disruptions in front of you, seeing how they interconnect, as Niels just talked about, and then pulling together alternative futures and scenarios so not just planning for the future that you want, but also the other ones that might occur. So we are not in the business of prediction, but embracing and understanding that uncertainty ahead of us. And what that looks like in practice is acknowledging that the potential for uh, very different positive futures might be there. For example, harnessing the power of synthetic biology to address zero hunger to drive and build food security. But as governments, we have some measure of shaping it, but actually we are also environment takers in the way that businesses uh, operate often internationally outside our gifts. So being prepared for both identifying what a positive future looks like in that inclusive vision way that Professor Kobia described, perhaps bringing youth together, for example, in Mozambique, talking about what an aspiration of 2030 looks like, but also at the same time, acknowledging that we are uh, environment takers and that we need to be prepared for how uh, the environment and climate change may play out in 2030, 2040. And in fact, the ability to both look out and be prepared for risks, as well as knowing the future that you want actually builds that ability to anticipate and be agile that is so important. And underlying all of those is participation, the importance of bringing in citizen perspectives into all of those endeavors. So I'm going to invite everybody um, in the audience really perhaps into the chat box to type in how prepared you think your government is for the future. And we can pick it up from there. But I wanted to kind of in this, in this few minutes, just talk about a little bit what strategic foresight is and what it can do, but then also talk about these case studies about how you can use it in public administration in different countries in, but also what are the kind of resources and the next steps that you can take. So let's look a little bit about um, some examples and um, the Montfleur scenarios all the way through the 30 years since then, uh, with now institutions like CPSI in South Africa, thinking about how you can use strategic foresight to unite conflicted communities around a positive vision for, for a collective future. You can also learn the SDGs are universal and applicable to developed countries as well. So Finland, we can, I think, learn a lot, a bit like in Costa Rica or Malaysia or Rwanda, 
for how they have been establishing some of the institutions for building the capacity to think about the future and scan the weak signals of horizon and to connect the insights into policy decision making. There is an aspect about using foresight as well at the city level, harnessing innovative um, insights for public service development from citizens, but also unlocking funding and also at a sectoral level, whether with smallholder farmers looking at the future of the tea industry in Kenya or at a global level, for example. So lots of different ways of structuring those conversations about the futures and what governments can do in particular, here are four ideas really, is just applying those insights on a particular topic and understanding and wind tunneling, stress testing your current policies. Are they relevant to those different futures? Or perhaps backcasting, saying, okay, if that's where we want to get to to 2030, what does it mean to do it at the end of the strategic planning process? And what does that mean that we need to have in place for the end of the year? In terms of um, engaging with both building capability and also connecting to senior decision makers. This is something I think that Geert said, the connection to the finance and ministry of or treasury is really critical. If you're building a portfolio of policy options, how do you make sure that they're resilient to different alternative risks possibly? Are you investing in different policies that prepare you for different futures? Thirdly, and I think this is a, a, a growing interest given the concerns about how COVID responses are, and the costs and distributions of COVID responses are playing out between generations alive and in the future. It's increasingly critical to bring younger generations into these planning processes and understanding the impact of decisions today as they're playing out for different generations. And we have an tool that you can use to, to assess that. And then I think thinking about foresight governance as an ecosystem, yes, spearheaded by units, but I think someone had mentioned the, the role of the judiciary and parliament as being the, the bipartisan holder of the long term beyond the term of the government is very powerful as well. This is a piece of work that we've done comparing 13 different countries from around the world and comparing their foresight ecosystems far too much information but you'll see it in the report ways in which you can build that culture that's so important because institutions work but culture and processes and people are what really make that difference so in terms of next steps reaching out to the resident coordinators the um the labs that someone's already mentioned that the UNDP run is a fantastic idea the um, CCA and UNDAFs are opportunities to have more ambitious programs, but connect to all those fantastic practitioners and colleagues across the continent and regional, some of whom are on here. Um, Arthur Malero from SIDS, Geshi from South Africa, running the Africa for Development Foresight Network, um, Alion Sal from African Futures Institute, but always share information about the region, about drivers, about trends, and focus your energy on the so what's. There are ways to kind of run short one hour awareness raising sessions with senior political leaders. Yes, this is what's gonna happen potentially. What ifs for my country, for my sector, for my policy out five, 10, 20 years in the future. But there are a lot of resources that you can call upon please don't reinvent the wheel and if you want to know more please go to that link swaf.org.uk on dessa and please reach out and thank you very much chair over to you thank you kat i will immediately uh, continue i think at this point it's dr rolf atler alter sorry Senior Fellow at the Hertie School on Risk Management Frameworks. So over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, for having me in this uh, amazingly uh, diverse, but also profound um, 
wonderful discussion place. Uh, despite all the distances that we have, we seem to have so many, many things in common and I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm talking about risk management. And I think I'd like to make sure we're just looking at what risk means, how it works and how we can make it perhaps a bit better when we want to go for sound policy making for the sustainable development. Next, please. You know, I heard this, uh, this afternoon uh, for you this morning that um, the wicked problems, uh, risks are certainly one of them, uh, no doubt about it. But not only that they are themselves complicated, but also that they are increasingly systemic. And it means simply that we now see risks ahead of us that may be a risk, not to some elements, but simply to the world, to the country, to even the systems in countries. And given that, I think we will need to call on all forces of government to go ahead and find ways for a sound response. And that's what it is, a sound response to our challenges. I'm saying we need to establish the conditions for implementation. This is a lot about, yes, it's about leadership, accountability and communications. I'm just building on what we heard, how important it already is. But I'd like to say it has a lot to do with two critical elements when we talk about sound policy making. And I think Mr. Abani brought it first uh, to the fore. The political economy means we have to find a way to make government machinery and political leadership interact in a very well-organized way, respecting each other. It's neither the ones nor the, the other ones that are uh, responsible for failure. And I'd say that we are, we have looked at what's happening in risk management around the world. And our note, uh, which I done with a few of our colleagues, show that there is work in progress. It's moving. It's not as if it, there's nothing happening. But it is true, given the first comment that I made, difficult subject matter, risk, it means we're seeing progress slowly but steadily. And it's not a matter of developed, less developed countries. You can see it. Second point I would make, the COVID-19 as a global challenge has shown that actually no country is really totally prepared to deal with that kind of an event. So I do think that we need to change, but of course now we want to be changing risk management in the context of the SDGs. Next, please. Very simple and really very straightforward, I'd say. First of all, we need to understand the risks. And as I said, complex, but it's not just to say, what's the probability and what's the impact? No, it is also about do citizens really know what type of risk is out there? Do they know what level of risk they want to take? Do they know what they can do themselves? For, to protect themselves. So understanding, big topic. Governments, governance for management of the risks. I want to show it in the context of the SDGs. But before I go there, just make sure we don't forget that we need to invest in being prepared. And we have heard again, some very decent proposals, how to do it. But here again, it shows Investment means that you have to decide in a political process, what are your priorities? And I do think that administrative 
and political vision have to come together to make sure that long-term visions remain really the direction to go. But at the same time, there has to be a respect for the will of the people today when they want to decide and they and establish government with legitimacy. And of course, crisis response and recovery. So let me go to the last. The last slide is uh, actually saying a very straightforward proposal that I would like to make. Countries I have seen around the world deal to different degrees with SDGs. And when I say deal, it means they have also institutional capacity established differently. There is no, as Gert was saying, there is no copy paste. Everybody has a, a, an, a, a, an adequate, a very adequate to the circumstances of a country, an idea of how to steer sustainable development. So, but there is that part of it. There are also people who are taking care of risks and country, as I said, it's not as if there aren't anybody. The point that I want to make is it makes entire sense to bring it together, to bring both strength of work together. And why is it so meaningful? Because we need to integrate what is happening now in different parts of government put it together and we would see that the result will be so much better because we will have evidence on risks associated with targets, with objectives. We will see that we wanted to take an integrated view on risks. Yes, but we also want to take an integrated view on the SDGs. So why not put it together, coordinate together, consult with the stakeholders in the same way make sure that we are inclusive, build and use the same institutions. Let me take an example. Centers of government very often are responsible for the SDGs. What would it be, what would be more reasonable than saying, let's move the responsibility for risk management into the same structure. Therefore, when we do think about the requirements for SDGs and the ideas about risk management, combining the two would certainly make progress in serving both better. And that's exactly the type of coherence and synergies that we are looking for everywhere. Here is a practical example how to move in that direction. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for that intervention. Can I immediately proceed and ask Dr. Dorothy Lux, the Executive Director of the SDG Foundation, uh, sorry, SDF Global on Monitoring and Evaluation Systems, sorry. Over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me fine? Perfectly. Good. Thank you. Um, and uh, good to be with you all. And thank you for engaging with me. The, I'll move fairly fast because we're running short of time. But one of the things that you've heard all of the other speakers talk about, and it was quite um, striking, was the use of evidence. And so where does that evidence come from? So I'm going to talk a little bit about monitoring and evaluation systems. And traditionally monitoring and evaluation systems have um, really been thought of as little backroom offices uh, that generate lots of dusty paper. Um, m and &E is the core of generating evidence for improved decision-making for good sound policies. If we look at the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation, 
they did an assessment of the quality of national development strategies and they found that out of 86 countries, 64% had very good national development strategies in place, but only 35% had in place systems to track whether those policies and strategies were actually achieving what they were meant to do. So how can we assess our performance and improve if we don't have the systems in place? The following year, they assessed that national strategies um, produced after 2015 do actually make mention of the SDGs. But if we take the 35% again, then how are we going to know if we're really tracking performance for the SDGs in an effective way? There are good practice examples, and there are many uh, more in the note, but two um, that stand out are Nepal, who actually revised their constitution in 2015 to align the constitution to the SDGs and to monitoring and evaluation practices. In Finland, you, we've already had uh, mentioned, they, in addition to looking at a national strategy for su sustainable development, also have committed to do a national evaluation every four years, and they completed the first one in 2018. So what do we mean by a monitoring and evaluation system? Monitoring and evaluation are very closely linked, but they're different. So monitoring for the SDGs, we're familiar with the indicators, the targets, but what about the data systems? The voluntary national renew reviews have been a way to draw data through the systems into a review process. But, and then those actually link up to regional and global reviews. And that provides evidence that helps to accelerate positive change. And we've talked about innovation and transformation, which then lead to impact in an inclusive way. But if we go back to the monitoring and evaluation system, and we don't just focus on the review process, but bring in monitoring and evaluation for strategies and policies, then that can be a much more dynamic and timely way to generate improvement and innovation in policy, both making and implementation. So how does m and &E do that? There's a traditional view of m and &E that it's basic data collection and often there's been a reliance on national statistics, which is good, but the sector is evolving. There's been a movement to results-based management that links data to national planning and budgeting, and therefore performance management and better use of resources. More recently, there's been a shift to monitoring, evaluation, and learning. So how do you take the data that's coming through from different sources and use that for evidence-based policy making and more effective change. So the learning cycles are important. We've also heard about the level of complexity of our world at the moment. And there are more dynamic mail systems now, which acknowledge the intersections between different sectors. They bring data together across sectors, look at trade-off and synergies and indeed the diversity. And we've heard quite a bit about the need to contextualize. Data systems now are much better able to demonstrate both standard data, but also contextualize to specific situations and contexts. So we can look at seven basic building blocks to look at. And right at the beginning of that, and we've heard that through all the speakers as well, is engaging stakeholders and in state, engaging them in participatory m and &E is really important. Measurability is pretty basic, but defining what needs to be measured, the indicators and targets, the SDGs have brought a focus on the importance of indicators and targets. But there's less focus on evaluation and we've put E times two here 
because actually it's not just about the evaluation, it's about evaluability assessment. What's the point in measuring something after the fact if the data wasn't set up properly in the beginning? So there's a need to make sure that policies can be evaluated. There need to be plans for how it's going to be evaluated and then how evaluations are going to be commissioned and resourced. Gathering the data is not just about quantity and more data. It's about gathering quality data and consistent and credible data and we know that there's lots of new technical tools available. So applying the right one in the right place for the right data, that needs to be specified. So actually looking at the data needs for decision-making and backcasting from these are decisions that need to be made now or need to be made in future and therefore this is the information that's required this is the evidence that we're going to need for better policy making and then once that evidence has demonstrated worth or value in relation to policy action that needs to be communicated back through stakeholders so that it closes the loop and moves forward on progress so in terms of actions that can be taken, what are the things that can be done right now to strengthen m &E systems for policy making? Firstly is to assess what is there in the m &E systems. How effective are they for policy making? Are they set up for MEL, not just monitoring and evaluation, but also learning? And does that link into good adaptive management? There's a, a dearth of m and &E capacity across many different countries. So where is that expertise within your national policy uh, setup? Is it within particular ministries? Is it actually being deployed in the right way to build systems or is it contained in some places and not in others? How well is your m and &E capacity spread across other systems? And what opportunities are there within the country to strengthen national m and &E capacity? How can you at the national level respond to new opportunities in m and &E or MEL? Is there an opportunity to update the technology for data systems, for dashboards, for remote sensing, digital mapping, big data, new forms of consultation and communication, using mobile phone technology, social media, etc. There are many new ways of drawing different forms of information that can be used as evidence for decision making in policy arenas. And then being more proactive in communication with stakeholders that that can be done through multiple communication channels. We've heard so often about the reports that are generated that sit on the shelf. Evaluation reports or monitoring data doesn't need to do that anymore. There are ways of generating data that links in with critical timelines for policy input. There are ways to bring the voice of those that have been left behind into the process and generate data that brings in their voice to that and making sure that feedback loops are there to test adaptive management actions and ensure that innovation is occurring. So um, I'll stop there, but um, I uh, suggest that you do go to the note and have a look in more detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dorothy, for that um, intervention. As all the panelists would have seen, there's been quite a discussion um, in the chat box as well. So I'm going to lift one or two questions for you to respond to because we don't have much time left um, uh, before we conclude this particular workshop. So Tsehu Fatsu has actually raised a point where she said, and she was following up on a, quest, uh, uh, a question by Paolo Solonaf, Lona, I may miss, I've mispronounced it. 
where she says in your last statement, and this is to, I think, Kat, um, you said processes are available, don't reinvent the wheel. As much as all African countries want development, however, countries differ from one another. Don't you think for African countries not reinventing the wheel, that is precisely why most African development fail. Policies should not be one size fits all, or I could say a cookie cutter approach. However, they must be inclusive and coherent. So I'd actually like all uh, um, the panelists to respond to this from the different vantage points in which you have addressed this particular subject of uh, policy integration, monitoring and evaluation and so on. So I'm actually going to start, I'll start with you, Dorothy. Do you want to respond to this particular question? Yeah. I agree that there's um, no need to reinvent the wheel in terms of there is information out there. Um, but actually using that information and, and taking it into context, um, absolutely, that's partly what adaptive management is. It's taking the, the knowledge that's there and, and then applying it to the specific context. The um, evidence which is available um, can be used in many different ways. It can be used to identify risk. It can be used to identify opportunities. Um, and that using the uh, information that's available allows us, and I noticed that in one of the comments, the need to reflect. Often that's what evaluation is, is reflecting on the evidence and then saying, well, how does that move us? Not just one step forward, but 10 steps forward. And how do we do that in a better way? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Rolf, uh, building on that and, and tagging on the question by Christopher, he says risk governance is indeed a critical imperative to address the complexity, dy dynamism and, and cascading systemic nature of uncertainty on the achievement of, of goal, global goals and objectives. So I want you to bring uh, Tsehu Fatsu's uh, point together with this comment and over to you. Thank you very much and thank you very much for those uh, comments and questions. I do think that um, we have techniques which are determined perhaps on the basis of the subject matter. If you want to have an idea about probabilities of risks, you need quite a bit of a knowledge of how to make these assessment actually resistant to scrutiny. That's something that everybody will have to do. There is no doubt about it. But of course, when you speak about the assessment turning into something that would be a policy response, the issue is, which is the channel? Which is the institution that responds to it? Which will be deciding about the instruments? When you have, as we heard, very tight budgets, the response will be different and will perhaps rather go to alternative instruments than when you think that you can afford paying today. The same would be true to talk to shareholders. Yes, we are all the stakeholders, the people that have really a stake in it. We would be surprised, I think, altogether, how often we say it, but how different countries go about mapping stakeholders, as it was said, mapping stakeholders. And therefore, I don't think that it is perhaps quite the other extreme that everybody has to invent process and has to invent these guidance that is there. 
But I think we need to make sure that systems thinking, as we say, becomes a systems doing. And that means you have to understand and you have to respect your context. I think countries are well advised to do not just look at the great examples elsewhere, but also look at it in what was mentioned in the beginning, Madame, peer review mechanisms. Talking, exchanging, finding out what others have done successfully and less successfully. And I do think that will really produce very valid insights into country specific responses. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I now uh, come back uh, to Kat and I think you've had the question posed to you. So over to you here. Yeah. That's a great question. And you know, what is transferable and what is context specific is a really interesting, challenging uh, um, thing to wrestle with. I, I always, in, in my area, uh, we, we talk about the, the issue is not a lack of insight about uh, insight about the future. It's not a supply side issue. The challenge that is transferable is how do you connect those insights about the future into policy making and decision making in the here and the now. Yes. And those are the insights that are transferable um, because very often it's about incentives that are the political pressures um, that, that others have talked about. Um, so I, I do think the kind of human decision-making and how you build institutions and build the culture of long-term thinking is very powerful and transferable. Um, I wanted to also pick up on the question around how do you make foresight endeavors, not one-off big events that feel so big that you've you got half a minute left. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to say to make it iterative, that point about integrating into schools of government and schools, primary and secondary schools, is critical. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mens, can I come to you for 60 seconds? I'm sorry about that. Sure, thank you. Um, I, I, I think all these notes are inspirations and should not be seen as uh, blueprints for, for how to do it. We need to reinvent it in every country, in every context, what works, particularly so for policy coherence, which is all about the institutional machinery. I would just say like reflecting on my own, I'm leading an organization of about 300 people and with seven centers around the world, including one in Kenya. And I would never take a, a blanket prescription from the UN or any other organization how to, how to run this organization you can take inspiration, you can read, you can look at some guidance and say, oh, that, that part might work for us. Okay, that little piece. And then you need to just piece it, piece it up together in the context of your reality and your institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Patrick, I'm going to get you to, to just... Uh, pull everything together, summarize, and thank everyone, especially the participants, the attendees who joined us today. So over to you, Patrick, because we've got three minutes left to the end of this workshop. All right, well, I'll be very quick. I'm not sure I'm going to, to summarize uh, all that's been said before. In fact, the guidance notes, again, that are available online uh, and the four others that weren't presented today uh, should be the, the summary that is, that is needed. At least we hope that they're going to be helpful to you. Uh, in your particular uh, context and in accordance with the national and local needs and priorities. Uh, we had a very large turnout today. There were more than 200 uh, participants uh, connecting. We had many more who were registered and showed interest. So we clearly, uh, uh, sound policy making um, is an issue that continues to generate a lot of excitement and where there's a lot of work left to do. And it doesn't all have to be complicated. We've heard today that there may be some, some uh, simpler ways of addressing these uh, issues. It really depends on, uh, on resources that are available and the level of interest and, and, and um, how, how to take these, this work forward in particular um, contexts as we've heard. 
Uh, we hope that this has increased your understanding of the awareness of the issues in sound policy making, but also that has uh, inspired some um, action oriented and concrete activities that can be taken forward with the help of the UN system and other organizations. There's been a, there's been a question about, well, what, DESA, what can DESA do? DESA organized this, of course, uh, this, this workshop and is working with all of the um, actors uh, concerned, but we're not alone. And our mandate from the Economic and Social Council, in fact, is to engage with other international and regional organizations and all other relevant stakeholders to take this uh, work forward. So we're, we are very interested in partnerships. Uh, we're particularly interested in working with um, regional organizations. We have a valuable uh, engagement with the African peer review mechanism on this topic, as we've heard earlier. And we also uh, are very keen to work through the, uh, the resident coordinator system and are extremely pleased to have resident coordinators joining us today. So I just want to take this opportunity lastly to thank our facilitator, uh, Geraldine Fraser Molochetti and all of the outstanding speakers we've heard this morning. We're, we're um, uh, extremely um, grateful for the work that uh, Ms. Fraser Molochetti is doing to promote the work of SEPA and the principles in Africa, as our ASG said earlier. I want to thank the ASG herself, uh, Ms. Spatolizano, for supporting this work for her uh, inspiring message of global solidarity and encouraging us to work together to deliver on the UN Decade of Action for Sustainable Development. I wanna thank the experts who've written these notes and have worked with their networks. We really valuable your contribution. It's extremely important and appreciated. Uh, so thank you very much. And I think that others uh, will share that sentiment. So uh, thank you all to uh, as well to the uh, participants, uh, the others who have not uh, not uh, taken the floor, but who've uh, provided many interesting questions, including questions that were raised uh, in advance during the registration process. Uh, this is this is also great uh, inspiration for this work. So thank you so much. Back to you. Thank you very much, everyone. And this is when we sign out. Um, I believe that this is an ongoing discussion and see this as one of many. So thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone.